Hello there and welcome once again to Breakfast All Day. So good to see you. I am Christy. Next up for us, I'm so thrilled to have my great friends, Katie Walsh from Tribune Agency back and Tim Grierson, a longtime Breakfast All Day friend from Mel Magazine and Screen International. We all have like six jobs and no job. Right. <laughs> We're all citizens of the world. It's, like very, the folk, it's very appropriate for the movie we're going to be talking about. I just realized. Yeah, I was going to say, like the folks right. in the French Dispatch, they're from Kansas, but also France. Um, this is the new Wes Anderson, and Katie's going to describe it to you. Okay. Yes. Okay. So the French Dispatch, on a macro level, is a tribute to the New Yorker magazine via a fictional magazine, which is an insert in the Kansas City Evening Sun. Am I getting that? correct Maybe. um and it's sort of the the pet project of um arthur howitzer jr who's played by bill murray who's sort of the son of the kansas papers publisher and he goes to france and starts this new yorker style magazine um so it's a tribute to the new yorker but it's also a tribute to like being in france and writing stuff for a you know american audience uh, but it's really a tribute to like very generously funded print media <laughs> r.i.p <laughs> r.i.p um but then it's structured within these little sections so there's a very short section and they're all based on magazine articles so there's a very short section where um owen wilson plays a bicycling journalist and then they go into a longer piece that is tilda swinton who's some sort of arts writer giving a lecture about a prisoner who becomes the star of the abstract expressionism modern art world played by Benicio del Toro and Adrian Brody is his agent who's also in the prison with him and Leah Seydoux is his model and she's a guard so there's this whole arts section then we move on to a section with Francis McDormand and Timothy Chalamet that has to do with student protests it's more of a political piece and then finally or did I miss one Okay, finally, no, that's the second one. Jeffrey Wright's last. Okay, the, the last one is the <laughs> Jeffrey Wright one. He's like a food critic or a food writer who gets involved in this kidnapping plot of the police chief's son. And there's also a police chef who he is sort of profiling and they all get embroiled into this um, into this kidnapping that happens. So it sort of feels like um, you know, Wes Anderson lives in France now. He's obviously working with his repertory players, but he's also, I think, in each section, he's kind of experimenting with um, tributes to different sort of French filmmakers. So the political protest one felt very Parisian, fun, pop, Godard, early Godard to me. And then the kidnapping one felt very like Jean Renoir, French uh, World War II spy movie. I don't know what you guys uh, thought about that, but that was kind of my takeaway that he was kind of experimenting with each of these little chapters and then also doing this like larger um, tribute to a magazine um, and magazine writers. And yet it's also every inch in a Wes Anderson movie. It's yeah, perhaps so it's the like most Wes Anderson-y things. Wes yeah. Anderson movie ever made. It is, it is. <laughs> so um, Tim liked this better than we did, Katie. You and I have had a little chat already about how, how we feel about this movie. Tim, um, I would love to hear your thoughts on this because I know that you saw things that we did not see. Um, well, I think I, I think I appreciate things I think that you guys weren't as into. Uh, in, I've seen it twice now, and I should say that. Oh, okay. Um, I wouldn't want to do that. Um, well, <laughs> the, 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 Katie did a tremendous job, I think, actually describing in sort of mm -hmm. like, and it's actually in Lawrence, Kansas. That's the only thing that's, um, is it, is it where more, KU is? I think so. Isn't it Lawrence, oh, Kansas? I think is that's it? right. So it's not the Kansas city evening I sun. It's yeah, I think it's, okay. a, I think it's Lawrence, Kansas. I, oh, I, okay. I, okay. I, I mean, that is neither here nor there. <laughs> I saw it, I saw Which it, city in Kansas is yeah. it? <laughs> See, you know, Katie, you didn't understand the city. And that's why you're, yeah. oh, I'm trying to find the most granular, mansplaining way to defend my case. Uh, no, you see, Lawrence is very different than Kansas City, Kansas. <laughs> so I saw it at Cannes. Um, and when I saw it in Cannes, I thought it was really like wonderfully designed, like it's production design, the way it's shot is really kind of gorgeous, but I found it sort of emotionally lacking. And I have to say, I think at this point in everyone's life, when you go into a Wes Anderson movie, you sort of have to ask yourself like, what kind of Wes Anderson fan am I? Are you sort of over him at this point? Or are you still kind of on board? Or are you 
kind of like me, sort of a case by case basis. I feel like, and I'm, and so I went into this one, um, just looking forward to seeing it, but a little bit disappointed that emotionally, I didn't think it was very strong. I saw it again, and I saw it actually with Kitty at the same yeah. time a couple of weeks ago, and I could tell that Kitty was enjoying it less than I was. Oh, uh, no. she, sat, she sat a row ahead of me. It wasn't anything demonstrative, but uh, just certain uh, head placement next to body. I was, oh, yeah. I, think I was trying, probably like... <laughs> that is the exact replica of what you were doing. Because yeah. you're trying to read all the tiny stuff in the maps and the dollhouses, right? Well, you're craning your neck to see it. Listen, I sit next to Tim quite frequently at screenings, and everyone can tell what i'm thinking <laughs> and I, I am I, not subtle i'm like no I, 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 only, I only bring it up because I, I i sort of anticipated oh i think she likes this less than i do so, so i saw it a second time and i went into it the second time being like i have real reservations about this movie and i found it working much better on its own terms but i also found it working much more emotionally than i think i picked up the first time like you were just saying christy the first time i saw it i literally thought um, I'm going to have to see this again because there's just so much mm -hmm. material on the screen. You know, sometimes people will say like with comedies, like, oh, you need to see it a second time because it's such like a dense comedy. But visually, there is so much stuff going on in the movie that the first time I saw it, I was like, well, I know I'm just missing things because it goes by mm -hmm. so, like, it goes by so fast. And even the second time, there were certain jokes where I was like, oh, I, I totally missed that like sight gag in the back because I just... I couldn't absorb all of this. I, you know, I wrote a piece for Mel, and the thing I one of the things I, I wrote was that I was not expecting Wes Anderson to become like the Michael Bay of art house, <laughs> which sounds like an insult, but like like the thing that they have in common now, and it's so much it's somewhat of a glib comparison, but like Michael Bay's movies in recent years have become so visually chaotic that you kind of have to almost be like, I can't, I can't literally absorb all of this it's impossible yeah and wes anderson movies i feel like starting with isle of dogs his last one and now this one as well are so visually layered upon layered upon layered that it's like he's working on a level now where it's like it's almost impossible to kind of absorb the whole thing so all that being said just really fast i found <laughs> i was able to kind of put a lot of that away the second time i saw it and actually sort of focus on the story and what he's sort of talking about and also being able to appreciate the characters because i feel like the first time i watched it I was like these characters all kind of feel like to use a word i hate like they all feel like quirky types and i can't entirely absorb all of them and the second time i saw it i was able to appreciate all three stories the first time i saw it um the del toro story i liked i think that's easily the best of the three i think he and adrian brody are really terrific mm -hmm. and i think leah Sadu is really good in it too the second two are not as strong i i do feel like they they do kind of gain resonance seeing it a second time and sort of understanding like west has like created a whole movie about people who are kind of unhappy with their lives and they're unhappy in very sort of different kinds of ways and i found myself sort of responding to that the first time i saw it, it was literally like visually what's going on what yeah. is happening mm -hmm. and that's and that is not me saying, oh, well, you need to see it two times to appreciate it. I actually think it is a problem in this movie. Yeah. That, that it, there it is so dense and that he is, I mean, he's always been very much on his own kind of wavelength, but even especially now it feels like he's kind of going into this rabbit hole that very few people can kind of follow. Mm -hmm. I got more out of it the second time, but I don't know if you necessarily should need to see a movie two times. Right, that's, that's my problem. It's exactly. like- I've, I've heard other people say like, oh, it really does get better on a second time. And I'm like, but you should be able to enjoy it once or enjoy it the first time. And the denseness and the lack of emotional communication, the, of emotional connection was what was preventing me from connecting, of, of enjoying it. And like my brain and eyes were like shutting down from all the dense information. I was like, I can't take this all in and I can't read all the little text and I can't see every every single perfectly designed little piece. And I felt like my brain just went like, no, reject, like <laughs> fall asleep. I got so bored and sleepy mm -hmm. because my brain was just like, I like rejecting what was what was happening. <laughs> right. And I don't want to have to watch it a second time either. You know, right. I, I appreciate that some films like definitely do get richer with repeated yeah. viewings. It, this is so off putting 
in the first viewing that I don't want to devote two more hours of my life to picking up all the, the richness that Tim speaks of. Like time is, life is short. Our, t- <laughs> our time is, we have a lot of movies to watch. Our time is precious. Um, yeah, I found this like annoying and then just eventually just tiresome, like overwhelming and then annoying and then tiresome. And yet with moments of greatness, because he is such a meticulous filmmaker um, and he's working with his usual cinematographer, Robert Yeoman. So there are moments of tremendous splendor, like when the Benicio del Toro sections go from black and white to color, for example, there are these like vibrant splashes of color all of a sudden. There are gorgeous moments. There's a a thing with um, Saoirse Ronan, where she's in it so briefly, but a, a, one scene is a close up of her eyes that yeah. is so romantic, it's heart stopping. You know, there are moments like that. Um, and I love individual performances. Tilda fucking goes for it, right? Always. Mm-hmm. She's always hilarious. And she gets this like meaty, eccentric character to play. Um, I liked Adrian Brody very much. It's, it's also so much of it is such rapid fire dialogue. And, you know, for the most part, they're up for that. Adrian Brody is very much up for that. Uh, and I, I like Jeffrey Wright very much in this. But again, the, the performances that I am pointing to are ones where the actors had the opportunity to really spend some time in a character. And so much of what is frustrating about this is that he's amassed a more enormous ensemble than ever. And like Edward Norton, who's been in other movies of his, like Moonrise Kingdom, like shows up for a second. Like people show right. up for a second and they're gone. Yeah. Like, oh, that was that was so and so. That that was so and so. And oh, come back. <laughs> you know, I just I wanted the time to take in all of the craft, and so I I got a little bit thrown, especially during the um, Owen Wilson section because he's the bicycling journalist and he's bicycling through the town of Ennui or Blase where they live, <laughs> and um, and I'm like, no, stop! I want to see that. I want to see those costumes. I want to see those actors i want to see those sets and and he, they're just you know flying through this town and i'm like wait i want to stop it slow down so yeah i do think like there's there's too many things going on so you're just like like i wish we could have lived a little bit more in some of these uh stories to at least f- you know find an emotional connection um but like everything tim said you know i totally agree with everything you said on your first viewing and then it would be interesting to watch it again but yeah I'm, it's like i'm torn i don't know i'm sure there's well, tons to to glean on the second viewing i don't know i yeah so <laughs> maybe i'm yeah, making yeah. sense yeah it, it makes for a very interesting question this idea of like uh do we owe it to filmmakers to watch the movies multiple times to get which is a really <laughs> it's, it's a really it's, it's an interesting question and it's, it's worth kind of like sort of thinking about the first time I saw it, I would say that I, I liked it. Yeah. I, I found myself, I wouldn't say I would ever, like, you, Christy, you meant like off-putting. I found myself more just kind of numbed by it the first mm-hmm. time. And really, there is a show-stopping quality, I feel like, to the film kind of over and over again. So even the first time I watched it, I wasn't fully emotionally engaged, but I was like, there is a lot happening. And I found myself kind of like, on a very superficial level, kind of like enjoying that. I think for me, it was more like, you know, what's the Jeffrey Wright character really sort of about? And mm-hmm. what is the Francis McDormand relationship with Timothy Chalamet really about? The, the middle section, the first time I saw it, very much felt like, oh, okay, so they're doing May 68. That's what they're mm-hmm. doing. And it's like kind of a riff on that. And I, I do think it, it, it gets stronger because I, I was able to realize, Oh, this is what's happening. You know, Katie, you said like each like short film is kind of like its own idea. I also think like he's doing different types of writing styles, sort of interestingly, mm-hmm. in all three of them. I mean, you mentioned in the intro, like each of these films is a section of the magazine. And so you have right. the food section and the lifestyle section and the art section. And there's that, but I also think like the Francis McDormand writer is different than the Jeffrey write writer like they write in different styles and so he's mm-hmm. also like Francis McDormand is doing more of the uh woman on the scene kind of reportage kind of thing and so that film is done that way the Jeffrey Wright one is done sort of a different way and I sense that the first time I saw it I got more out of it the second time because mm-hmm. it's been said a lot like oh this is his love letter to the New Yorker I think that's definitely true but I also feel like the movie is kind of like his love letter to making art and being an artist because obviously del toro is an artist um 
Timothy Chalamet in a way is an artist. Like he's writing this manifesto, which he is doing a very bad job at, which I also <laughs> think is very funny in that section, that he is a very bad manifesto writer and Francis McDormand has to help him um, with that. And then of course, Jeffrey Wright is a, a food writer of, of some kind. The chef is an artist as well. In terms of like Wes Anderson sort of doing a tribute to artists, I feel like this is like one of the more, like his films never feel entirely personal because those are there are those like those layers that he creates that yeah. distance himself from it. But I, I do feel like, and I think this is where I sort of fall on the Wes Anderson fan scale. I do think the emotions are there. I think sometimes he doesn't put them um, out in front very much and he makes you kind of have to work for it. And I think it's a completely fair argument to say I, he makes the audience work too much and then yeah. he hides behind like, this is clever, this is cute, this is ornate and sort of fun. But I think those layers are there. And I think that especially when the movie, you know, I don't, want, I don't want to spoil how the movie ends, but I think how it resolves itself, there is something that is very kind of bittersweet about this idea of, um, I mean, it's established at the beginning of the movie that the Bill Murray character, who's the, the owner or the editor rather, he doesn't want the magazine to exist after he's gone. That was in his will. And so in a lot of ways, the movie is sort of awake for, mm -hmm. the, for this publication. And there is a poignancy throughout the film. And I think the poignancy is also in, the main characters of each film who are just not happy with their lives and kind of wish that their lives were different. And did it take me a second viewing to, to notice that more? <laughs> yes, it absolutely did. <laughs> but I do think it's in there. I do think it's in there. Um, and that and that worked for me. And also, you know, Christy, you sort of alluded to this. It jumps around in terms of like aspect ratios, mm -hmm. color to black and white, animation pops up there's some pretty dazzling stuff in this. Like there is a whole chase sequence that is done through animation. And it's real, like there's, it's, it's live action, then a chase happens and that's done in animation. And that stuff is pretty dazzlingly done. I also think the score is really great. I would say that for me, I think when Wes Anderson stopped doing uh, 60s soundtracks mm. and started having like scores. Right. Uh, it's I think, uh, Alexander Desplat, right? Yeah. And yeah. he's worked with him for a while now. Yeah. I just feel like that has lifted and elevated his movies because the score, I think, does some of the heavy lifting in terms of sort of the poignancy, the sort of wistful quality uh, in the film. Um, so yeah, I, I you know I was really glad I, I have to say that I saw it a second time because I think in some ways, it's um, it settled down a little bit for me. But it also <laughs> I think but I think I also made peace with that this is not one of my favorite Wes Andersons. Yeah. No. But that it's I was able to kind of accept it on its terms this time. Like oh this is you, like this is the this is the flex. Like this is really the <laughs> of all of his movies. This is the real like yeah it did like, but yeah. It's a flex, but it also feels like a troll. I will, it's total, it, it feels I, like a I troll. I think you're totally right. I, I totally agree with that, Christy. Uh, Katie, like, totally oh yeah, you don't like my style? Here's more of it. There's yeah. a sequence <laughs> where he's putting text on screen and it's tiny and it's going backwards. Uh -huh, like it's yeah. like scrolling up. Yes. And I'm just like, fuck you. You think I'm going to read this shit? <laughs> like, sorry for swearing. But I was like, at that point, I was like, I'm mad. I'm mad. Yeah. But it's, um, it's, it's funny. I have Wes Anderson here. Hold on a second. <laughs> We but also, ask him. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I think also like I wasn't, I didn't love the animation sequence because I was like, why is this happening? Like a lot of the choices, like the color black and white, I could not discern a pattern to why that was happening. So I was a little bit frustrated by that. I didn't understand why we went to an animation sequence. Like a lot of these choices, it felt like style for style's sake. And I just like fundamentally don't respect that as a filmmaking choice. Um, like just throwing down the gauntlet there. Um, but I do have a question for both of you, which is like, what did you think? I So we have like the framing device of like talking about the magazine. And then the sections actually have framing de devices as well. One of them is Tilda Swinton giving the lecture and then uh, the Jeffrey Wright section is, is framed by him recounting the story on a TV show to Leah Schreiber. So I don't get why it was like framed and framed and framed. And I'm wondering if you guys have any thoughts on that. It is up its own ass. 
That is my thought. And he's making you work. It's just more work. It's like flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks. And you reach a point where like, I just didn't want to do the work to figure out what was happening. Like, where are we in time? Who's actually narrating here? Whose story is this? I didn't care enough to figure all that out eventually. Which sounds right. reductive and dismissive, I realize. And I'm a Wes Anderson fan. I really am. But there's so much stuff and so much stylistic clutter here that he gets away from the potential emotional heft of the sad characters that are his through line throughout his filmography. Like, I love Wes Anderson movies. I love Rushmore. I love Moonrise Kingdom. I love Fantastic Mr. Fox. Like, I'm a fan. And this is just like all the maximalism of all his worst self indulgent tendencies. That's my feeling. Tim, what are your thoughts on the framing? Well, I mean, the, the trolling thing I'm still stuck <laughs> on, which, which I think is, is completely <laughs> fair and very funny, and I think actually right. I, the the more generous way of saying it, perhaps, is <laughs> I, I, there is, to me, I, I read it more as enthusiasm. I, what, what, is, what is funny about the movie, I think, is that there there is a... There is a, I would argue there is a giddiness in terms of all of that layer upon layer of just like, oh, and we can do this. And we can yes, do this, yes, there is. That. Yeah. And there's something that I, I find charming about that, though it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work. No question about it. And it's also the trolling thing is perfect because there is sort of a what I what I do find kind of funny is when people are like, oh, well, he's at it again. Like people, like, listen, like his movies, don't like his movies. He is. He is not going to do like he's not going to do Lars. He's not going to do Lars von Trier. He's not going to do Terrence Malick. Like he's going to do. You he's know, like, not experimenting. Like at this point in time, he's right. doing his thing, and I totally yeah. respect that. Right. It's fine. Right. So, so and I'm not saying that you are saying that. But I think it is. Sort of right. I always like we put like walk out of movies like they're kind of like flabbergasted. Like I thought he was going to change people. Nope. No, no. He's more out, of himself <laughs> now. Yeah, I mean, as, as you pointed out, Kitty, like he's lived in France for a while now, and so right. like this is like. What I think is funny about the movie is that in some ways, I bet this movie is pretty personal to him, but right. you would have to um, know him like super <laughs> right. well to go like, oh, that's so Wes. He like, that's right. <laughs> him. Whereas for the rest of us, it, it is, it's an elaborate dollhouse construction. There's no question that's, that's what he's doing. Um, but there are parts of me, because I do like his movies on the whole, and I, I, I try to generally kind of like him personally. I mean, we're like spent a lot of time with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, to me, it, it radiates more as uh, geeky fandom as yeah. opposed to- uh, Aggressive. Uh, yeah, <laughs> aggressive or obnoxious. Yeah. Or I mean, you know, you, you know Chrissy said like off-putting. Like, I, it, to me, it seems more in a weird way that's him expressing love for something is him <laughs> doing it this way. And, and obviously how you feel is how you feel, but no, I, I know. I think, I think it, I responded more to the, like the geekiness of it. I found like charming, I guess is how I would put it. Okay. And like, I, I wrote in my review that like, it's so hard to be critical of a movie that has such pure intentions. Right. And, you know, usually when I hate a movie, like I don't hate this movie. Like I, when I hate a movie, it's because it like deeply offends me or, or something like that. But this is, um, I, like you can feel the love and the excitement like pouring out of this movie, but I just was like, I can't handle this. Like it's too much. And you know what? There's a some funny sequences of Bill Murray doing editing where he's like editing his writers and he's saying, we have to take this out. We don't have enough room. And I'm like, you needed a Bill Murray. You needed someone to just be like, <laughs> Take this out. Take this out. Ah, the irony. But Bill Murray is also <laughs> indulgent of his writers who would rather cut true. ads than cut the copy from his precious true. stories. True, 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 true. There you go. Anyway, though, it you is, can... though it is funny, I would say that that, that this would probably this is probably not going to go well in this room. I'm about ready to propose. Mm-hmm. But as you mentioned, like Ronan's bar- barely in it. Edward Norton is barely in it. I actually wonder if a longer version of the movie works better <laughs> because maybe some, it might because, maybe. because some of those like like normal cast members of his would have more to do, and I have I have no idea. Maybe he was just like, I'll I'll, I'll bring my crew in, and I'll, a couple of them will just do like small little things, and they'll be fine. But they were especially like that first time. I'm like, I didn't realize Saoirse Ronan was in it because it's so fast. It's so yeah. fast. When I saw the end credits. I'm like. Wait, oh, that's who she was in. So I don't know if like a longer version of the movie actually fleshes out some of this stuff a little more. Who it needs who to knows? be a whole series. 
Yes, I would be, I'd be okay with that. If we got room to breathe and like, look at this stuff. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you read a New Yorker magazine, I mean, you read it over the course of like a week or a month. That's why like, I can't subscribe to it anymore because it comes every week and I'm like, this is too much. Mm -hmm. Um, so it is the kind of thing that you, you know, you put down, you read a little bit, you, I, so it takes a long time to get through. So it's kind of mimicking the, the process of reading a magazine. The density of the, con- yeah. the whole process. Um, okay, so what are your numbers then, friends? Katie, what's your number? Uh, 4.5. Okay. Tim, what is yours? I gave it a 7.9. Okay, I'm saying 4.8. So our number is 5.7. The French Dispatch is very much in theaters and not on your television at home. You have to leave your house to see <laughs> this. Wes doesn't want you to watch it on your TV. God, how hard is it going to be to like watch that, you know, once it does come streaming or whatever? Anyway. Yeah, if you could like watch it at home over a week, you know, that would be sort of the optimum. I know. (laughs) Or put it on Netflix, like they have variable speeds. You can watch it on like slower speed. (laughs) Just pause (laughs) and read the map, like the map that Jeffrey Wright has. Like I wanted to like turn my head. What are those rooms? What are they? I will say that I will say the next time I watch this thing, I can't wait to pay more attention to the voiceover and a couple of those stories because it is impossible to follow the voiceover as visuals are happening. I just right. have I just have no idea. Was, I've seen it twice now. There's still a ton of stuff I missed. There's still like, I don't get that. That stuff's confusing, but. Uh, well, maybe we'll all watch it again and then come back and then have a t- right. totally different experience. Let's make, <laughs> let's make a date in a month or something. Yeah, right. I'm, looking forward to, I'm looking forward to the angry call of, hey, we watched it a second time. You're still full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are just dumb. This was easy to figure out. Um, all right. You guys are wonderful. Katie and Tim, I love seeing you. I wish I could see you in person. Thank you so much for joining Thank me. You. Thanks for having us. Yes, on Breakfast All Day. And uh, like this video, we're a video and we're a podcast and you can enjoy it on a multitude of platforms. We are at BeFast All Day on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. We have a Patreon. It's patreon.com slash BeFast All Day. We are currently recapping the morning show. So come and join us there if you have not already. Um, Thanks from Alonzo as well and from Matt. And we will see you guys next week. Bye.